Well, hey guys, welcome to this edition of Theology on Call, and it's going to be a little bit different than what you're used to, and I know it's been a while since we've had anything, so the new iteration of this program is going to be me talking with other people like me about things that I enjoy talking about. <laughs> so here we are today, and we have Dave with us today, and uh, Dave, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, James, well, first of all, I wanted to say thanks for having me on. I just really appreciate the opportunity to come and and share with you and with your audience. Um, I am a uh, almost 30 year public servant. Um, I've uh, been on active duty in the military for 20 plus years and uh, have been serving in the public uh, side of the house for a number of years uh, since that. Finished my career <clears throat> serving two presidential administrations in the White House um, on their National Security Council staffs, uh, supporting emergency management, which was really pretty exciting. Um, so I still live in the Washington, D.C. area now, and um, I do consulting work uh, back to the federal government mostly, uh, mostly to the Department of Homeland Security and to the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And again, just happy to be here and share. All right. Well, I'm glad you're here, and I've gotten to know you over the last few months uh, through some you know, intimate work around some different things, and we, we might talk about that today. But ultimately, mm -hmm. we're together today because we've been talking for a while about two specific things, about spirituality and about leadership and how that stuff intersects. And, um, you know, so I was thinking that the last time we spoke, it, it was one of those things and we have both said, man, we wish we had recorded that conversation. So one thing <laughs> today is we're never going to replicate a good talk, <laughs> but uh, yeah. the Lord's mercy, we're going to have things uh, come out that need to that need to be said. And one thing that I really want to accomplish is to just introduce the idea of spiritual leadership, to talk about it, and then to talk about the program that we've been we've been working through and that you've written. Um, and uh, you know, in the future, everybody's going to sort of hear about where it's going to be and how it's going to look. Um, but specifically, you know, today, I, I just want to talk about why. You know, what? Well, let's just let's just do this. I mean, what is what is spiritual leadership? How would you define that? Well, you know, um, it's a great question. And I, and I think, you know, anytime I think we talk about something like spiritual leadership, that I think it's always worth breaking down that into a couple of components. I think you also have to talk a little bit about what does it mean to be a leader, first and foremost. And I think there's a couple of different ways you can kind of talk about that. And then, you know, what are some of the attributes and characteristics of being a good leader? Um, and I think there's plenty of examples in in history that talk about that. You've got your George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, you've got Gandhi, you've got a whole bunch of other people there. But I think specific to your point, when you talk about spiritual leadership, I'm talking about taking it basically one step, um, one step further. We've, you and I have talked a lot about um, in some of our programs and things we've talked about in the past is, you know, particularly for men, I think men, as they get older into their life and into their relationships, they have a tendency to lose purpose, right? And, and lose focus. And we talk a lot about how do we get men to um, regain their purpose, regain their focus, and really work on what we call filling their own cup, right? How do you get yourself uh, filled so that you can you know, move forward and not only serve yourself, but serve your family and others? And to me, spiritual leadership is about taking that cup to the next step. It's about helping men and, and women, right, basically fill their spiritual cup so that um, their cup is overflowing, right? And it's about really um, providing a structure where, you know, you can provide leadership in your home, um, in your community, um, at work even, um, and do that in such a way that you're doing that where you bring um, the word of God, Christ, um, into how you, how you lead. And to me, that spiritual leadership is all about taking leadership and, and furthering that through your ability to lead through basically through Christian values. And when I talk about spiritual leadership, I'm talking about taking your cup and overflowing that. So my goal is to overflow your cup by helping you know, men, women walk with Christ um, to have and show and live a life filled with faith, love, mercy, uh, and compassion. 
And that's kind of the basic premise behind uh, the program of spiritual leadership. That's good. That's great, Dave. There's a lot of things that, that you, I mean, you answered almost half the questions that I had for you and just that, <laughs> but there's something that a lot of people will hear when they hear the word leader, they think of being in charge and you have, you have defined leader as service and servanthood. And then you said, yep. and you know, I've had to deal with this in my own life, spiritually with the evangelical world that I grew up in. And, uh, you know, you know, you're a piece of trash, you're, you know, and I understand the, the teaching of sin and original sin and what we would call in my circles, total depravity, do not deny that. But I think that the gospel of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel of sovereign grace tells us that we are now free from that. We are now not necessarily personally righteous, but we've been declared righteous by being clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And so the Bible would teach us that the mind of Christ is a mind of a servant. And so the first time I was told, you know, over the last few months to fill my own cup, I had, I had some cognitive dissonance. I had some issues that I had to deal with. And one of, one of those was, well, I'm not supposed to be filling my cup. Um, that's, that's, that's tough. So when I think of what most people hear, when they think of a leader, they think of somebody that's in charge, somebody that's the boss, somebody that's over everybody, but that's not what you've said. And then the second part of that is like feeling, filling someone's cup that almost seems sinful. That means selfishness, but it's not because the way you've described it is not selfishness. So talk about that for, did you, did you have that same idea when you first started thinking in this new way? Well, I mean, you, 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 there's a couple of things there to unpack, right? Um, when you talk about leadership, I think a lot of folks, um, if you just ask them, say, define a leader, they would say almost exactly what you said. Someone who's in charge, the CEO, the, the general officer, right? Um, the person who is leading a project uh, or, or a mission. And, you know, so I think what is probably often mistaken um, when folks talk or at least think about leadership is they they don't think about what goes into being a leader right mm -hmm. and really a leader is someone who really has really especially spiritual leadership has three three main qualities that i think have to be paramount to any kind of a person who's going to be consider themselves a, a successful spiritual leader and that is a person who one, first and foremost, um, serves others, right? Mm -hmm. You have to be in a position of servitude. And I think you kind of talked about this to um, not only want to serve and to put others first, but do so in such a way where you're not expecting anything in return, right? So you're not trying to give to get um, as, as part of that. And I think there's so many great examples, um, even throughout the Bible of Christ just serving, right? We talk, we think about um, the servitude that, that Christ had. And, um, you know, I, what comes to mind for me is Jesus just washing the feet of the 12 apostles, right? Uh, in right. complete servitude, which to me just speaks uh, complete volumes there. Um, so service is certainly uh, one of those things. Um, I think the other thing is um, you've got to talk about someone who um, I call it shepherding right um and, sh and shepherding goes along the lines and includes leading when you think about a shepherd a shepherd's job is to um protect the flock right and when one of the flock goes missing the shepherd doesn't think about all of the flock that is still present you know the shepherd is worried about the one that has gone astray and will do whatever it can to go and get that one stray um animal and bring that back into the flock. And so shepherding is also a really important attribute. I think you've got to think about when you, th when you talk about spiritual leadership. Mm -hmm. And then the, the final piece of this is, is you got to have a leader or you got to be a person who really cares deeply um, around those that, that are, that are around them. You have to, you have to care. You have to, um, um, you have to kind of be able to put yourself out there um, and be empathetic and understanding of what folks are going through to kind of fulfill um, all three of those pieces there. So serving, you know, leading, uh, caring, those are the three themes that I think carry through spiritual leadership and really kind of, you know, in my mind, are things that separate just being a leader of an organization 
being um, a leader of a military unit or the like and transitioning into what, um, you know, I call spiritual leadership. Right, right. Yeah, and it's, it's extremely biblical. You know, when I think of being in the pastorate for 26 years now, it's, it's just hard to believe that that kind of time has gone by. Right. I remember being in my 20s and being ordained and going into the ministry thinking, oh, gosh, you know, can I just get to be 30? Can I just get to be 40? And then I've just turned 50. And I'm going, can it slow down a little bit? But I <laughs> I think that, you know, everything that you've said, it's not what I think. I know, like uh, Paul says, to do everything. Don't, don't do anything out of selfish ambition, but to always, in humility, count others as more significant than yourselves. And Jesus even says that, the, that I did not come to serve, to, to, to be served, but to serve. And Paul tells the Philippians, you know, have this mind among you, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So what you're talking about is, is gospel. It's gospel centered. It's Christ centered. It's the glory of God revealed through leadership. Like, you know, we could have another conversation about how the marriage picture displays the gospel. Well, leadership displays the gospel. And yet I was raised under a system in the ministry that, you know what, you're, you're the king, you're the pastor, you're the big guy. But yet the Bible always taught me not to feel that way. So I was at this seesaw, you know, when things needed to get done, everybody's like, well, why don't you just tell them this is how it's going to be versus why don't you lead others to come to these conclusions? And it's a very difficult thing. It's not, it's not easy. It'd be much easier to have it be like the military. Okay, you're my sergeant. Yes, sir. <laughs> and that's the end of it. Um, well, well, there, there. I mean, there. Are, I mean, there's two types of leadership, right? There's, I mean, in some ways, right? You, you, you are a leader in, in two different ways. You are either given leadership, right? You are put in a position. You are made a vice president of a company. You are a CEO, um, or to your point, right, you are promoted or into a rank in the military, say, for instance. So, so you have leadership or you have power based on your rank and your stature. But there is also the other side of that coin, where is you have to, true leaders have to earn the respect and admiration of those they are leading, right? Um, I like to use the term, you know, leadership in its very basic form is getting others to do something that they would not otherwise want to do. Right. And if you can get someone kind of in that position, then then you are leading them. And I think, you know, James, kind of listening to you talk there, the other thing that kind of struck me as um, really um, a, a, a characteristic or a principle of leaders that I think oftentimes goes unnoticed is, you know, people always think that the top of the food chain, they're the, that they lead the organization, they're out in front. And while in some cases that may be true on an organizational chart, um, on a battlefield, say for instance, but leaders uh, going back to that piece of servitude, um, really a lot of times um, are last, right? They are not the person who is first in line to get things done. They're making sure their people are taken care of first, their family is taken care of first, their children are taken care of first, their marriage is taken care of first. And it's that servitude piece that sometimes I think, and that ability of, you know, not necessarily always being the first, you know, the first in, in line or the first to go through the, the chow line or whatever it's going to be, that people sometimes overlook that leaders often are last. And I think that bringing this kind of full circle comes back to the point you were talking about earlier, and that is, well, filling my cup, doesn't that seem a little bit self-centered and doesn't that seem a little bit self-perpetuating that, hey, I'm putting myself first and, and not everything else. And my response, I think, to that is um, if you don't fill your own cup first, if you don't um, fulfill your purpose first and your vision first for where you need to be, you know, as a man or as a woman or as a leader, mm -hmm. you can't effectively lead others either so um you know i think you know there are many aspects in that you have to kind of consider but certainly um you know i think it kind of works in a very cyclic kind of emotion there to kind of make that all kind of come together yeah that's that's good even jesus in, in john chapter 4 with the woman from sychar the samaritan woman the disciples had gone into the city to go buy food and when they came back they the bible says they were astonished that he was speaking to her 
a, a woman and a Samaritan at the same time. And they, they offered him food, and he says, I have food that you know not of. And later, as John writes this on the Isle of Patmos, he, you know, he, he reflects on the fact that they, we were asking amongst ourselves, who gave him food? Did she give him food? Who gave him food? And he <laughs> said to them, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. And so let's put that in perspective of Jesus filling his cup. Jesus would, could say, I filled my own cup by serving the one who sent me to fill your cup. Because isn't that exactly what he told her? You come here to get water that you need, but you're embarrassed to come to the modern place because yep. you sort of got a bad reputation. So you come here, yep. I can give you water that wells up and overflows to eternal life. So it's a really beautiful picture. And I think that's something that, that I want to really keep top of mind for myself is that it's okay to find intersectionality with words and with meanings and with intentions, especially around the, un, the non-Christian communities, because this, the, what we're talking about here is not something that is just for believers, but I think anyone who leads, anyone who serves, if they're never going to become a believer, then what's the best way to teach them to become a leader? Why don't we teach them this model? And so that brings me to, you know, sort of my next question for you. I mean, here I am, a pastor of a church, been a pastor for 26 years, like I've already said, and I've been part of a lot of programs and a lot of things. Um, but why, why, do, why do we need to start a new program for spiritual leadership? Isn't there plenty out there? And is the church not answering this? And I know that, that might be a little bit of a, you can say, oh, I don't want to get into that. But I mean, I think this is a conversation we probably should approach. Well, well, look, there's a couple of things that you said there that I want to um, unpack for just a moment. And I, I totally agree with you. And I, um, I, I love the vision and the example that you gave there of Jesus at the well with, uh, with a woman, you know, he, person who drinks of the, this well shall never thirst again, right? You know, um, kind of a thing. And, and I, that's, that's so powerful in and of itself. But, you know, I think as you and I have kind of talked about even in the past, the, the Today's society just seems like um, it's more chaotic <laughs> than ever, right? And I think, you know, every generation can probably say that. Um, even all the way back in Jesus' time, I think they can say that there was chaos and things that uh, that back in their time were, were, were cause for, for, for some concern. But you and I have talked a little bit about um, a larger vision that I had for a program I called Spiritual Warfare, the Spiritual Warfare Program you know, based on um, Ephesians chapter six, right? And, um, you know, starting in verse 17, where we talk about putting on the pieces of God's armor um, to, to, to help us, right? And to kind of help us and serve and leading and caring. And all that, that's a d discussion for um, another time. To me, um, taking um, a sub set of that, which I'm calling the spiritual leadership side of this, is is really important because I think when you couple this with um, the other leadership attributes you have, you, you you couple this with filling your own cup and getting your own purpose um, and understanding where you need to go and, and, the, and the person you need to be, spiritual leadership um, will help arm you um, with the tools necessary to be able to withstand all of the trials and tribulations that today's world is going to throw at you. I mean, in today's world, there just seems like there's a lot in it. It seems like it's a very fast paced uh, kind of an environment out there. But spiritual leadership, the way I'm envisioning this and the way I intend to kind of present this is a really kind of a step by step process where I'm going to lay out for um for participants and for people to really examine and you know incorporate or build upon um things that you know would help get them started successfully on their spiritual leadership ship journey and i think when you combine that with a couple of you know other qualities spiritual leadership will do a couple of things for you i think one it'll crystallize your focus for the new you, right? It'll help crystallize that and make things very clear on the direction you need to go. And I think by arming you with some of the things that we teach in spiritual leadership, you're gonna be more confident and more empowered um, to be able to um, lead your organization, to um, lead your family, to lead within your community. And you know, I think when you have that confidence and that uh, empowerment, 
Um, I think that that's, you know, a very powerful piece because for me, nothing is impossible with God. Right. And when you combine all these things together, you're going to be more uh, resilient to withstand um, the everyday challenges you're going to face. Look, I, I, you know, you and I have talked about this again before, but, you know, to me, the only way to do this is to have your spiritual clip overflowing so much that you are louder than the circumstances around you. Paul uh, writes about this in Theologians, right? In chapter five, it says, rejoice at all times, pray at all time, uh, and give thanks in every circumstance. Because, you know, in today's world, you know, those are the challenges that you have. So you let the truths of God's word be louder than the circumstances around you, be louder than the lies that surround you. Uh, and when we internalize God's word, we can draw upon his armor, in particularly the sword of truth. Um, and that's going to help us be in a much better and a much stronger position to, to, to lead in a very chaotic and very troublesome world, in my opinion. Yeah. No, that's beautiful. That's, that's really, really good. And I, 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 I've had several mentors throughout my life. They were always short lived, but I've had some people that tell me some things in my spiritual journey uh, that were practical. And one of those was that, I mean, I'll just quote him. He was telling me one day about leadership and, and the responsibility that comes with it that I had been given as a young man to be in the ministry early on. And he said, James, he said, if you're out there and you're leading and you turn around and there's nobody following you, he said, you're just a man taking a walk. He said, you're not a leader. Sure. And we, I think that that is the epitome of what we see in, in the world that's not there. It's the antithesis. This is the, we're, we're seeing a lot of people going someplace or charging some people to go someplace, but no one, they're not leading anyone to someplace. You know, the Lord is my shepherd. He leads me, you know, Christ leads us. And this, this mindset is so, it's so important. Um, but you know, I, I, I keep coming back to this idea, you know, this, this program we, we've talked about, it's going to be um, it's going to be in written form. It's going to be in video form. It's going to be in lecture form. It's going to be personal. It's also going to be available to do asynchronously. There's a lot of different things that, that we've discussed as, as, as you continue to develop this program. Um, but there again, I, I, I have the, uh, the, the gnawing question that I get from people sometimes because I've, as you've gotten to know me over the last few months, you know that I, I like to create things. And I've always had this, well, why do we need that? Or why do we need this? We've answered why we need uh, spiritual leadership. But I think that, that it's a new idea and that the Bible, and maybe I'll just sort of get, let's just talk about this. I believe that when the scripture teaches us to go and make disciples, that when we come together on what we call the Lord's Day and we worship and we study the word, the Bible tells us in Ephesians that we are supposed to be doing that for our own benefit, for our own joy, for our own correction and direction and so that we might minister to one another as a body as a spiritual family but it also says so that we may be prepared to do the work of the ministry and the ministry leaves the worship center leaves the worship time and goes and lives in the real world and i think we are now existing in a world at least in my experience that everybody wants to find their own echo chamber their own tribe their own ideology their own politics and only relate there which according to the Bible is the worst thing we could ever do. And then so for those who say, okay, I won't, I won't live only there, I'll evangelize. Then they go out and they strong arm these ideologies, forgetting that the Holy Spirit of God is the one who convicts and, and gives faith and causes us to believe. Um, and then when someone doesn't receive that, then they're just washed away and, and wiped off. And I think this program is going to assist the church but I also think it's going to equip the church outside of itself to grow and to lead others. I mean, is that the way you see this? Yeah. I, I mean, look, I think there's always um, room and ability to do, to, to do more. Um, and certainly I think there's a need to kind of um, groom the next set of, of leaders out there, particularly, you know, spiritual, uh, spiritual leaders, um, men and women who, um, have a foundation based on Christian principles and Christian faith, right? And I think um, we we as um, as Christians are called to um, go out and to minister where we can, um, but we've got to do that steeped in the teachings of what the Bible says, right? I think to your point, 
um, you can easily, I think, get distracted with other things that are out there. I mean, look, Google is a wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, tool, um, but I think you can easily get distracted and um, certainly sidetracked with um, certainly opinions that aren't based and steeped in what the Bible teaches. And so that's, to me, is one of the main focuses of what we've got to stay centered and grounded in. It's it's not just providing le uh, spiritual leadership based on you know, serving and leading and caring, um, you've got to do that in such a way that is steeped and grounded in what is taught through the Bible and what is taught in not only the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament. Because otherwise, I think you get out of alignment. And I think it's very easy that you can, um, you can get just sideways there. And then you find yourself in kind of uh, theological discussions with folks who, who are like, well, yeah, but Dave, what about, or yes, James, what about this? And I think as long as you can keep um, that steeped in what is being taught from the Bible, you're on solid ground. And it's going to be hard to argue with the opinion based off of, based off of that teaching. Yeah, that is so true. Yeah, it's funny. You, you don't know this, but I, I use that in a pejorative way when I make an assertion sometimes in my teaching. And I go, yeah, I can hear some of you now. Yeah, but. I don't want to hear the yeah, but let's just accept it the way it is. Let's don't, <laughs> don't rebuttal. Let's receive it and think about it for a little while, and then and then engage it. Um, it it's 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 really important to 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 realize that we. I mean, even for me, I'm all. I mean, we always hear those things, yeah, but but that's yeah, well said there. Well, let me ask this: what does a what does a man or a woman? What does a person? Um, who enters into this program, who begins to interact with the material, with the teaching, what, what do they get? I mean, what, what is it that they're going to help to, um, to receive, to solidify leadership in their understanding and their application? Walk me through what that looks like for just a moment. So basically, what are they? You're asking, what are they? What are they going to get out of this? Yeah, I mean, what is a what is a person that goes through the program? What does it look like for them in, in so far as their leadership growth? Uh, are there any particular things that stand out that, that will take place? Uh, some of the things that you're going to be teaching, some of the um, ideas that you think are important um, that people will, will, will grow or develop by going through the program? Yeah, I, well, look, I think uh, first and foremost, um, like we kind of talked about, um, I, I think by going through the program, um, you're going to come out better armed, more equipped um, to, you know, be able to withstand, you know, what's going on around you. Um, certainly, like I said, in this kind of chaotic world here, I think um, by kind of taking a deeper look about how you can lead and um, serve others um, um, and how you can work to uh, kind of be a, a, um, a trusted leader, one, starting in your own home, because I think it's important for, for me that if you can um, take some of the things we're going to talk about within the spiritual leadership program and apply those to just one, be a better person yourself, right? One, you're going to be a better person. You're going to be stronger. You're going to be more steeped in your faith. Um, that's naturally going to transition into it and transgress into your home, right? You're going to be a better dad. You're going to be a better mom. You're going to be a better husband, wife. Your children are going to um, are going to feed off of that. And just by um, you know, uh, just by that alone, you're going to start to be grooming the next set of spiritual leaders in your home by um, teaching your kids and working with your kids and leading with your children as a spiritual leader. So that's that's one aspect of it. The second piece of that is by building one stronger home, one one home at a time, you can start to then build a more resilient and a more powerful community. Right. And you can be um, a more resilient community. You can have a stronger community based in spiritual leadership. Um, and if you can build a stronger community, you can build a stronger city or a town and you can build a stronger town or a, a, a county. You can build a stronger state and so on and so forth where, you know, we can we can take this and, you know, in my vision, get this to a point where we can have uh, 
stronger communities across the country. By, by doing that, you're going to build a stronger nation and, and globally, you can have a stronger, stronger community across the, across the globe. So those are some of the things I think you can kind of take out of this. Um, you know, to me, um, you know, it's about embracing a holistic approach and a view um, that really fosters an environment where trust is going to flourish. Conflicts are approached with with empathy. Solutions are sought out with greater good in mind. Um, it's about really kind of taking a look at the entirety of the human experience, experience encompassing, you know, our intellectual, our emotional, our spiritual dimensions. Um, and like I said, you're going to come out of this with a better position to be in service to others, to serve, uh, leading with compassion, with empathy, empathy. Um, and caring and shepherding those around you. And again, for me, especially, I want to focus on that family, that family unit. And again, if we can kind of pull all of those things together, you're going to build strength, resilience and inspiration um, that I think is going to have a huge impact. Um, like I said, not only just on the family unit, but in our communities at large. Yeah, that's great. That, that's really an amazing vision. I was thinking about the fact that, you know, you, you work and live in D.C., the, the hub of leadership for our country, politically, economically, et cetera. And, uh, you know, generations to come, if people learn to be leaders effectively with the undercurrent of spirituality and service, I, I think we'd see a changed country. I really do. And we wouldn't see these polarized ideas and ideologies that we have to be an enemy of people who don't believe like we do or see the same thing or have the same perspective um, or what have you. And I really can see this as an impetus, as something to gain momentum and, and, and assisting the call of God in the lives of believers across the country to, and even the world, to actually start to focus on leadership, meaning more than just getting stuff done uh, and being someone who takes someone somewhere else, but it's really about intimacy. From what I hear you say, it's really yeah. relationships. And so uh, whether I'm a father or a mother or a daughter or a son, uh, whether I'm 12 years old or whether I'm 92 years old, I'm a leader in some aspects. And so this is, uh, this is you know, holistically, I think this is what I'm hearing you say. And uh, it's, a, it's a very exciting thing. And of course, you know, I know, I know a little bit more about the intricate details of all the different modules and the things that we're um, going to launch in, in the near future, and I'm excited about it. And I know that, um, you know, the Bible says, as iron sharpens iron, so does one person. Uh, you know, it doesn't mean actual literal male, but as one man sharpens another, one person sharpens another. Um, that, that has to be done in daily life. And I used to make the comment that everybody in the world is an evangelist, and everybody in the world is an apologist. And mm -hmm. You know, and the reason I say that is because we always talk about what we love and believe in, and we always defend and stand for what we stand for and what we believe in. And so, you know, this is an area where you have come to a place of realization that it's something that you needed. And like I've said, there are two types of teachers. There's a teacher who gets the outline and, and absorbs the information and disseminates it. And there's the teacher who, through experience, lives it out and then shares the experience as well as the information. And I know that you're the second type of, <laughs> you're the second type of teacher. Um, do you want to talk to any of the things that motivated you to do this or do you want to save that for another time? Well, I mean, I, I, I can, you know, certainly touch on that, um, you know, a little bit. I think um, part of it, it was just spending some time in my own self-reflection. Um, you know, I had gotten to a deep, um, a dark place in my own life where, you know, I was experiencing trouble in relationships and, um, you know, certainly um, just kind of feeling generally lost with where I kind of thought I needed to go. And, you know, for some time, certainly for me, I always kind of felt a tug on my heart that God was trying to call me to do something more. I didn't necessarily know what that was. Um, really until I started to get, you know, into my low, right? And I think, you know, we, we've all heard those things. No one really understands how much they need God and Christ in their life until they reach rock bottom. Um, and then they, 
you know, then they figure out that they need to turn to the Lord and kind of, um, you know, get their life back, uh, uh, you know, straightened out. And, and in many ways, right, that's the way, you know, sometimes I think, you know, Christ works where, you know, um, he will take you down just so you can, you know, turn yourself back towards him um, and let him help work and inspire you back into having a close personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what it's all about. That's what kind of happened with me. And so as I kind of to do some, started to do some self-reflection about, okay, how did I get here? Um, and how am I going to get myself into a better position um, where I can be uh, a man that I want to be, the man that I can be proud of, where I can help and serve others, um, and where I can do something in such a way where I can take my deep love and faith and believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and take that and do good for others. And so I, it's, it was, I don't remember the exact day or how it came about, but all of a sudden it just kind of hit me that God was calling me to, you know, basically take what I have learned over my 30 years of being in public service and being in the military, take that leadership side of that and tie in my knowledge of uh, spirituality and take that um, and help to teach that to others, to take them on a, a, a personal journey that really can have far reaching implications for them that can, and, 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 you know, we can build a, a, a group of leaders that enables leaders to um, inspire and to uplift, um, to empower, um, and to lead with deep conviction and faith, um, knowing that as they go forward, there is nothing that is uh, not possible with God's help. Mm. And I think when you kind of embrace this, uh, uh, transformative power of spiritual leadership and you dive into that, you start to harness the wisdom that comes with that. And you can let that guide you um, towards creating a legacy that is marked by purpose and compassion and have profound impact, um, like I said, with your family and with your with your community. And quite frankly, the, the biggest challenge with all of that was just overcoming the fear and the anxiety of, of kind of kickstarting this program and getting that out there. But I think, you know, when you kind of overcome that fear, you overcome that anxiety and you uh, reflect and you pray on that uh, um, purposefully, um, you can clearly hear, um, you know, God speaking to you. And it's just about experiencing the risen Christ and allowing the Holy Spirit to work within you um, to kind of develop a program like this. And I'm just, I'm really excited about the program. Um, you know, uh, overall, James, I think, like I said, it can have a very profound and wide arching uh, impact uh, on so many different levels. And I just kind of can't wait to start getting it out there. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be great. It's gonna be great. And I'm gonna speak just a, a second to to an overarching vision that that you know my audience doesn't know much about at all. Um, but without any real details, but you know, we're Dave and I are in a space right now where we're helping mentor other men and growing together with other men who want to be leaders and who are looking to some of them spiritual issues, some of them are Christians, some of them are not. But we have a, a calling and a responsibility to engage, especially as believers, with the scripture in every facet of life. So it's not just about evangelism unto eternal life and faith. That's God right. doing. But it's like everything that I've ever done in my life. You know, I've, I've got a lot of hobbies, a lot of interests. I've mastered a lot of different things and, and just interest in my own life because I wanted to connect with people. And that connection has brought about God developing the opportunity and producing the opportunity for the gospel to be lived and spoken at the same time. And one of the things that I've really um, come to understand is that authenticity, being real, attaching to the root of my identity as a, as a human being, um, was yeah. something that I had never done until I, until I turned, well, I was in the middle of my 48th year. So I'm, I tell people now I'm 18 months old. And so, you know, Dave's probably in the same context there, <laughs> came to a place where, you know, he has, he has discovered that he wasn't really knowing who he was and a lot of the men that we work with 
um, have been in that same thing. And so I'm excited about this as a way of really having opportunity to reach out and have an impact in the world that's not so, and I'm going to say something sort of harsh right here, and I don't mean it to be that way, but it's not going to be so, it's not going to be so tainted with the Christian cover of what culture has, what Christian culture has become. Because you have said uh, dozens of times, you have said the word compassion, you have said the word kindness, you have said the word love, you have said the, these types of things, which is the epitome and the centrality of God displaying himself in the Son, God the Son, um, to the world. And Jesus came to save his people from their sins. He didn't come to condemn them. And so, you know, we're, we're getting out into the world, not trying to rebrand the church or to rebrand the gospel. That message can't change, but we are repurposing the intention and making sure that what, I mean, because evangelism as we know it, the church life that we know in today's society is only a couple hundred years old. It's not, it's not antiquity. It's not old. Um, it's very contemporary. And honestly, as I begin to study and grow and learn and learn to be quiet and listen a lot more and pay attention, I've realized that it's, a, it's, it's not as biblical as it should be. And so teaching people about leadership, teaching people about sewing, teaching people about <laughs> whatever it may be, if we can do so as ambassadors of God's grace, as people who find their hope in the sufficiency of Christ and in the promises of God through Christ, knowing that his sovereignty is beyond all things and that no matter what we want to do, if God wills, we will do these things. And when we don't, it is because it is for our good, as the scripture teaches us, that God calls us all things to work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And so I just put that out there because in 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 the last year, I have been called a social psychologist. I have been called, you know, a psychologist. <laughs> Uh, because I've really been focusing on this idea of identity. Now, as a Christian, the Spirit of God, and listen, I tried to walk away from the faith two years ago. I tried to leave it. I tried to leave the ministry. I tried to leave my marriage. I tried to just walk away from everything because I, I didn't like who I was. I saw myself for who I really was, and I was a victim, and then I became a victor. And so and now looking back at that, I'm going, wow, you know, God had a greater purpose. I thought I was maybe a Peter, maybe a David, but I was really a Jonah. <laughs> I was running away and, and trying to do everything my own way and my understanding. But, but God was gracious in that. And so now I don't have to apologize. And you don't have to apologize. We don't have to worry about what other people may think about what God's called us to do. We're just going to act out of that authenticity. We're going to act out of that real identity. And for people who are believers, we know that ultimately my identity is found, our identity is found in Jesus Christ. We are his workmanship created to do good works, which God prepared beforehand for us to walk in. And Pastor Trey, one of my other pastors, taught on that this past Sunday, and he ultimately unpacks it this way, is that God has saved us by grace. He's adopted us by grace. He's regenerated us by grace. He's justified us by grace through the death and life and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our sins are paid for. So we are a new people because we've been called the righteousness of God, and so we are. God loves us in that way to declare us such because Christ has settled that debt. So it includes the fact that we're to be together in the calls and the calling of going out and making a difference in the world in every way, not just in gospel proclamation, but in every way, which includes gospel proclamation, in, in my opinion, every opportunity as, as we have it. So that's sort of my two cents in that, but we've, we've been talking almost an hour now. So anything? yeah, well, look, if I could just, I'll, I'll say something in quick conclusion here, uh, James. And, you know, I know, I, first of all, again, like I said, I really appreciate the conversation, but you know, for, for me to kind of put a fine bow on this, you know, spiritual wisdom, um, you know, isn't a modern invention or, you know, certainly a passing trend, you know, that's been around for, for millennium. And I just think as we, you know, look to navigate the complexities of our, you know, today's interconnected world. Um, the call for something like spiritual leadership has never really been louder. It, again, in my opinion. Um, and to me, um, the spiritual teachings that have been around have provided um, guidance on ethics. They provided purpose um, and the deep and really deeper aspects on really human existence. And by 
by rooting our leadership styles in this timeless wisdom, as I'm calling it, you know, we draw from a fountain of knowledge um, that's really been refined across generations and it offers insights and perspectives. And it, to me, it transcends the, a lot of the immediate challenges of the moment. And, you know, as I've said before, in an era that's really marked by rapid change and diverse narratives, um, where some are pushing certain ideologies and cultural shifts and agendas um, that are causing many people to rebel, right? And you were just kind of talking about this, I think a little bit. Spiritual leadership in my mind emerges as a beacon of hope, right? Uh, spiritual leadership emphasizes the interconnectedness that uh, really we as all of mankind you know, need. It doesn't discriminate uh, based on race, color, creed. Um, it's an urging to lead with compassion and understanding um, and a sense of, of shared destiny. Um, it encourages us to extend grace and show mercy where we need to. And when we as leaders, I think, embrace this holistic approach uh, and view um, we foster environments where trust flourishes, conflicts are approached with empathy, solutions are sought with greater good in mind, um, and I might add, done through the lens of biblical teachings while walking with God and not against him. And that's, right. that's kind of where I see it all kind of coming together. Yeah, that's a that's a beautiful recap, Dave. I think that uh, that sums it all up pretty well. And this will be the first of many conversations as, as the program starts and as things begin to launch in sort of a private circles and we start to put things out more in the open. I'd love to get together and even work on some of the just just the teaching aspect of it to, to have to have you on again, to have you talk about some of these things and, and just sort of um, just sort of continue the conversation, because I think that it's an area that for for me and my congregation and my community and my world. Um, I don't know anyone who doesn't need this, so yeah. I'm ready to see the Lord's hand in it and his will be done. And we'll, we'll go from there. Uh, any, any last things and not we'll sign. Yeah. J J James, again, just I want to thank you for having me on. I just really appreciate it. I always appreciate our conversations. Uh, they're always enlightening. I always learn something. Um, and, um, I just, uh, just appreciate you so much, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, everybody, this has been Theology on Call. I'm James. This is Dave, and we will catch you guys at a later time. Contact information for both of us will be in the show notes, and we will see you very, very soon.